is a uh, simple hack to make your Django website faster by Jitinder Agarwal. Jeet is the CTO of uh, Slide Rule. He is a graduate from IIT Bombay and has been building complex web products for 15 years. Uh, am I audible? I was very impressed with the last talk, colorful presentation. This is my first IoT talk. Uh, I'll be compelled to buy an Arduino and Raspberry Pi now. That's a big hole in my pocket. OK. Um, so I'm part of the slide rule team. Uh, people call me Jeet. Uh, that's the Python way of renaming uh, variables. OK. Uh, let's get down to agenda. So Python or Django will try to, since it's a Python, will sway to our tune. I know uh, they can't hear, uh, but we'll still try something. Uh, I'll try to say cache 200 maybe more times. Um, we'll discuss why websites are slow. We'll look at some optimizations, basic optimizations that Django query sets offer. And then we'll get down to caching. Okay, And what Django offers, what other types of caching can you use to make your website seem faster. Okay, And then we'll get down to Q&A. All right. Why websites are slow? These are just some of the reasons. Bad code, bad uh, indexes. Uh, bad indexes is very, very common, uh, surprisingly, but it is. Uh, and too much traffic. Uh, you probably have five servers, and um, you, you are trending on read it, and you need 10. Uh, so yes, you may not have ample hardware, or your architecture just supports one server. You did not consider distributing, right? And now uh, your bad host. And there are many other problems. These are just some of them. We'll try to tackle uh, maybe just too much traffic in this talk. Before that, yes. Um, if you have a site that gets like 20,000, maybe uh, 100,000 visits a day, you probably don't need a lot of caching or optimization. You can probably even do bad code and it'll still work. So I had one case where uh, I had a Django website and I was running on a economy $3.98 server on GoDaddy. And I just decided that it makes sense for me to just generate static pages from Django. And uh, I was hosting my sites, and I we could do 300 to 100,000 um, visits per day easily without you know, doing much. Because I decided to generate static uh, pages. All right? So yeah, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, if you Try to optimize your code before your features are developed. Uh, it's not good. So let's look at some of the SQL optimizations. Before that, uh, you want to, I, I, can I assume that all of you are familiar with Django? Whoever, who uses Django here? Oh, wow, nice. So no converts today. You're already following Django. Yeah, so uh, the first thing is, as I said, your SQL queries might be slow. You want to find out what SQL queries are running, and ORM kind of hides it from you. I read a quote somewhere saying, ORM basically fools you into believing you're coding, and uh, you forget SQL. So this is a simple method. You just add a logging configuration in your settings.py, and uh, you would be able to see the SQL queries. Or there is an easier method. You can just uh, install Django toolbar, and uh, click on the SQL queries uh, tab, and you'll see all the queries for a particular uh, page. All right? Now, one of the first problems uh, we can solve is double evaluation of a big query. So you want to get count of a product. Uh, let's say this is a simple model with products. Okay? And uh, it has some fields. I have not shown them here. I didn't have enough space. I looked at. I attended the first talk, and I could not see the code. So I removed a lot of code on the fly. Uh, so yeah, this is a simple model. Uh, it has um, a count similar product uh, method. This return and the space is actually uh, return. This returns the whole count. Okay, These are not two different lines. And you'll probably do the same thing in, in your view, then you'll probably do the same thing in your, uh, uh, let's say, in your uh, templates. And maybe the count could be uh, 
printed twice in the templates, right? So your query is being evaluated multiple times. The same query, unfortunately, is running multiple times. That's not good. So you can probably save that simply by using something called cache property. You can cache a property, and uh, now when you run the same thing, uh, the cache property will actually come at uh, just above uh, count similar products uh, method, right? Uh, it's a decorator that will cache the property for you for the life of that object. So every time you call count similar products for a product, it'll simply go ahead and return that variable to you. It'll not count again. If your database changed in between, it'll, you'll not get it. But for the life of that object, for that query, uh, for that page load, if you're doing the same query again and again, which would be very easy to find if you are printing a SQL queries, right? So that's the first thing you can do. Um, you can, I don't think you can really overdo this, but yes, if you, any time you are calling any foreign keys, any many to many keys, this works brilliantly. Okay, then uh, let's say another uh, uh, model, we have pizza and topping. I think I copied it directly from the Django um, I copied it directly from the Django documentation, okay? And you have a topping and a pizza, and you are trying to uh, use, you know, a simple STR method that also prints the topping's names along with it, right? So every time you are trying to print the object pizza, you will be doing all these queries all over again. And in fact, what will happen is, uh, You'll do one query for pizza object, and you'll do, say, if you have 10 toppings, you'll do 10 queries for toppings object. Even if you do a cache property, you have done, if let's say there is one pizza with 10 toppings, you've done 11 queries, right? So even the cached property will not really save you much. It'll just ensure that every time you are printing the pizza's name, uh, you don't do those queries again, but you are you're doing those 11 queries, right? So what you can simply do is you can do select related toppings, you know that you're going to use toppings in future, so you can select them at uh, at the go itself, right? So any foreign key, if you are planning to use the foreign key later, I recommend doing this. Any product or any order has product, products are foreign keys, I recommend that you do a select related. It will basically do a join. So there is a join query that will be sent to uh, your MySQL or uh, Postgre, and uh, you will save those 11 queries, one for pizza, 10 for toppings, and you will compress that to just one query. That does not work for generic foreign keys. This does not work for uh, many to many fields. And for that, we have prefetch related. So when you do prefetch related, it will get those toppings, and it will actually do the join in Python. So it'll, it'll, do one, it'll do two queries, one for the pizza, one for all the toppings, it'll do the join. So yes, prefetch queries probably should not be done when you have a whole lot of data, right? But one, if you just had foreign key, 11 queries would get reduced to one single SQL query. If you have many to many queries, uh, many to many fields, 11 queries would get reduced to just two queries, all right? So that's, that's simple, basic SQL optimization that I believe everybody should be doing. Uh, doesn't hurt much. Okay, now let's get to caching. So we, we saw that basic SQL could be, basic SQL queries or large queries could be cached with cache properties. The caching that I'm going to talk about is slightly different, but yes, it is caching after all, right? What is caching? It's a process of keeping often requested objects closed. So cache property, what it does is basically assigns an attribute uh, when it is called the first time. Whenever it is called the next time, it'll, the decorator will basically check for that attribute. That if the attribute exists, then it will return that value of that attribute instead of calling all the queries and the method again and again, right? Um, yeah, so one such example is uh, Ch Chetan Bhagat books. Um, if you go to any big store, they'll keep them very close to the counter and cashier including razors and stuff, which are very frequently requested. I'm assuming Chetan Bhagat's books are very frequently requested. Okay. And um, 
almost all computer systems you use caching at many different levels. Your processor would have L1, L2, L3 cache. Your disks would have uh, rotating disks would have caching. Your OS uses caching. Your STD I/O library uses caching. DNS, you have cached servers, databases, browsers, and websites. Yes, that's what we are talking about today. All right. Uh, so caching is essentially if you are trying to do something again and again, and you are trying to use resources for that process, you can probably just keep uh, results of that. You can execute the process once, keep results of the process saved somewhere, uh, which is fast uh, or faster than your normal uh, way of executing that process, and that use that the saved value next time, right? Uh, let's see how Django can um, help you with cache. Django offers a whole lot of different caching mechanisms. You can cache the whole site. Um, you can use a caching middleware. Uh, you can cache views. If you know that your home page view or contact view or team view does not really change until you fire someone, uh, you can use uh, caching views, right? Uh, you can, if you're not happy with caching the whole view, if every user gets a different value, then you can uh, cache different uh, template fragments so that a user loads your site again and again, but uh, the values are not changing. So you can serve the same value to them uh, by using template fragments. Sessions, uh, raw objects, and uh, Django offers many types of caching backends. You can use memcached, redis with the right uh, libraries installed, packages installed. You can also cache in database. So you can take a full page that took two seconds to render. You can cache it in database, the full rendered page. That is possible. Uh, I would prefer caching it in memory over databases. But yes, it is possible. Okay. So a simple way to use caching, you define caches dictionary in your settings.py. And you say where your caches are lying. I'm using a memcached example here. Or you can use database cache. This is, there is an indentation error here. There are two different examples. right? So you can use memcached v, radius. You can use file system. I've used two here. And uh, in case of memcached, you can use multiple locations uh, to work with a memcached cluster. All right. Uh, sites caching is like kind of useless. If if you really need sites caching, you can probably, as I said, generate static pages, and that's good enough. Um, but yeah, a per view caching uh, works, uh, is usable sometimes. So for example, this popular view that I'm talking about, you can just uh, say that this should be cached for 600 seconds. That's seconds. Uh, you can use a variable there. You can use a setting. A variable can be defined in a settings. We use a dictionary at slide rule. You can use that. It's not very useful if you want to serve uh, pages based, different pages. Same URL should serve different pages to different users. Uh, we'll get into how uh, you can do that. But yes, if everybody gets the same thing, then this works very well. It also sends expires headers. It also sends last modified he headers with max age, depending on the uh, cache value that you have set. So it also allows you to do some client side caching at this level itself. Rather, it enables clients and caches. All right, next. Template fragments. As I said, you can have a page, uh, say your home page, where you're probably showing um, a user's cart. Right? So everything else remains the same, assuming you're not personalizing your home page. Everything else remains the same. Just the user's cart keeps changing with every refresh. Right? So you can potentially try and say that, hey, um, cache part of the page which is constant for all the users. And I'll only calculate the part of the page, or I'll only re-render part of the page that uh, is distinct for every user. You can actually say that for this user, let's cache it. So this user refreshes it every time. So the same fragment uh, is cached. So probably could be used for somebody who uh, is making an email server where your number of emails remains the same unless you get hundreds of emails every second. So your number of emails could also be cached uh, within a fragment. 
Um, are you guys with me here uh, so far? Right. So we have we have defined two fragments here. One is a home page footer which remains same for all the users. The second is a footer with a username that changes. Right. Use them inside blocks. Multiple cache blocks within a single block are possible. If you use template inheritance in Django, you can define blocks, and each block could have multiple uh, cache blocks internally. And use lazy objects, because if you are not using lazy, ob lazy objects in your view, then potentially you are evaluating the query anyway. Right? So you want to reduce uh, your queries to your database server, which uh, you after hearing my, my talk, you'll probably believe that all sets are slow because of because they use database. Uh, that's partially true, uh, but yes, essentially what you need is um, lazy objects that don't get evaluated until you hit uh, the templates. If you are already evaluating them in your view, uh, then your template caching is like more or less useless. Uh, template caching also allows you to delete. Uh, caches, which is very nice, because as I said, if you have uh, you know a team page and you fire someone, then you need to refresh uh, your template uh, when you delete your team members or when you disable your team members' profile, right? Okay. Uh, sessions, of course. So for sessions, you don't have to write any code if you want to cache that. Just define a session engine, and that's good enough. A serializer and an engine. Assuming you have already defined your cache. So you have done full site cache, we have done views, we have done template fragments, sessions. Let's see how you can uh, do individual objects. You can, you should be able to cache individual objects, something like um, number of videos on your uh, YouTube website, number of products on your website. Uh, you probably don't need to do, you do want to do a select count star every single time somebody hits your page, right? Number of um, uh, objects in a particular category, products in a particular category on an e-commerce site, right? So you can cache individual objects. You can cache any key value pair, which is what most uh, caching engines like Memcached or Redis would support. Redis would support much more, but uh, for now, we'll just stick to key value pairs. You can say Python, Django, you can do get, you can do set, get, delete, you can do set many, not all backends may support this. Um, and you can also do increments and decrements. So the count that I was talking to you about, every time you add a new product to your uh, uh, database, you can probably do a count increment instead of calculating the count again and again. All right? Now, invalidating. As we discussed, you can do set, get, delete, or in case of tem template fragments, you can find the template fragment key and then delete, right? That's called invalidating. So you have your home page, you uploaded a new video. You have a YouTube kind of site, you uploaded a new video. You want everybody to see new, uh, your home page with the new video that you have uploaded, then that should come first, right? So your template fragment that you had made for your home page is now invalid. You want to make sure that your cache fragment that you had cached should be deleted, right? And uh, your post signals, post signals are very handy there. You can also use periodic crons or salary tasks to do that. I've seen people doing it. Um, but uh, signals uh, work very well. You can just um, use any create signals or delete signals to uh, change counts. You can uh, use change signals, any save, post save signals to, uh, yeah, I'm using post save, to cache objects again, or just say that this object should not be cached anymore, and whenever somebody else loads the object again, the product again, you can cache it again. So invalidating can also be invalidate and populate the cache again. It's your architecture choice. But invalidating is not easy. In fact, somebody said that it's one of the two most difficult things in computer science. Okay, now caching, so that's that's all for Django. Django offers you a whole lot of caching 
at every single level. But you can do more. Your web servers can cache. Nginx can define a simple, uh, simple cache uh, object for you. For example, Flipkart's menu, the category menu that sh gets shown every on every single page, every single load. If they have 10 million page views every single day, everyone is accessing that, right? They can probably, uh, or they are probably already doing it. They can probably just use web server cache to serve it. It's a simple JSON, right? Uh, you can use something called Varnish in front of your machine. And Varnish can cache results. You can say that Varnish should cache for X number of minutes. You can use a cron to probably, uh, you can use a cron to go to all your pages once. And Varnish will have you know, all your pages in, in the cache. Uh, Varnish also allows you to punch holes for user personalization. We'll, we'll discuss that uh, in the next slides. You can use CDNs. They do caching at uh, CDNs who would cache as close to your customer as possible. Right? And browsers use caching. If you refresh a page, your assets are not downloaded all the time. All the images are not downloaded. Your uh, jQueries are not downloaded all the time until you, unless you say, you know, get it again, definitely get it again. So if that's what people do, you basically ask your browsers to cache your images, your logo, your JavaScript, your CSS. Somebody comes on your site first time, they probably take time. The next time onwards, they don't download the same resources again. Your, their browser is caching it, all right? And you can cache in database, right? MySQL allows a simple one line uh, change that says, uh, I want a 500 MB of uh, cache built into uh, MySQL. So any, any query, in fact, you've probably seen it. 16 MB is probably by default. You've probably seen it that you run a query on MySQL, it takes two seconds. You run the same query again, it, uh, it gives you a result very quickly. That's MySQL query in action, uh, query cache in action. So MySQL can cache a lot of queries. Uh, and in some cases, uh, MySQL query cache is sufficient for a lot of people. Just do a slave instance, uh, MySQL slave, and uh, uh, just do query caching a uh, decently big size. It doesn't work very well if you have a site that gets a lot of inserts and a lot of updates, because every time something gets updated, you delete the whole cache. I mean, that's what MySQL does, right? So invalidation happens very fast, and that's why uh, we still need to worry about cache uh, caching on our end instead of MySQL handling it for us. All right. Then there are other methods. You can do edge side includes uh, Varnish. I talked about Varnish and Akamai. Both allow you to do edge size includes. You can, uh, just like template fragments, we were able to say that a part of the page is unique for every user, different for every user, and should not be cached with the whole page. You can also do the same thing uh, with ESI, you can say that there is one full page that Akamai or Varnish should cache. And then part of the page should be fetched from another location. That's edge side includes for you. And then uh, people said, hey, we are putting in a lot of efforts in doing this. Essentially, a page gets loaded. And then Akamai sends us five requests for loading different objects. And then uh, they realize they can probably do something similar in browser. And uh, that's how Ajax was kind of, uh, Ajax became popular. You send HTML template, you send uh, a REST query or uh, an Ajax query, and then you render your data, right? So your template is still cached. A lot of your data can still be cached by the browser, right? Just the values uh, that you want to change for every user can be fetched by a custom JavaScript and uh, the page can be populated. And this, this becomes really, really, really popular, right? Almost every website does this. They'll give you first HTML really, really fast. And then they'll make you wait for, they'll say loading. And that loading is essentially loading the data, right? That allows them to uh, cache uh, the whole template, cache the commonly used uh, variables at browser level. The, the server doesn't even get hit. Okay, now 
since you are talking about making websites faster, uh, caching can only do so much for you. Uh, for inserts, big inserts, big updates, uh, caching doesn't work. Right? Caching is primarily meant for read-heavy websites. What if you have a write-heavy website and uh, every time you make a change, uh, you write 10 different queries, so something like Twitter, which probably writes into 5,000 different tables when one single tweet is sent, tables belonging to your followers. That will be insane, right? So what you can do is you can do those parts later. All the operations need not be done synchronously. You can say, yes, your tweet has been submitted, and we'll now spread it to your followers, right? Confirmation emails. Uh, somebody registers on your site. You want to connect to an SMTP server, or you're using API, which in turn is connecting to an SMTP server. What if the SMTP server is down? You can keep trying, maybe two or three times. Your user is waiting. Instead of that, you can say, hey, we'll send your email. You'll soon receive. Anyway, the messaging is you'll soon receive a confirmation message from us. It need not be done with the request. You can just say, you can schedule uh, a request to send confirmation emails later. Right? Um, Elasticsearch or Solar updates. If you are using Solar or Elasticsearch for, um, for search, then every time a product changes, a description changes, you need not update Solar on the fly. You can say that Solar gets updated later, right? Large report creation. I've seen that with uh, PayPal. If you download a huge report, they'll actually say that we'll send you an email. The report may take a couple of minutes. We'll send you an email once the report is ready. Assuming your PayPal store is doing well and you get hundreds of transactions, if you have like 10 transactions, they'll give you a report right away. But most of the times, they'll say, hey, we'll send you a report later. They understand that the report is huge. Users are willing to wait, because if, if you just make their browser wait, then essentially what you're doing is your browser will time out. Right? So instead of that, you can say, hey, we have taken the request, we are processing, right? and we'll send you a mail later. Right? So you can. You can use Celery or G event or any such process to schedule your events in the future. Just don't make the users wait. And uh, we've talked all this, but you need to probably try all this. Um, I'll use a very good quote here that just by telling you that these things exist, nothing will happen. You need to continue, you need to try these things. You need to simply configure a cache and do a bit of get put, and that will make you an expert. All right. These are some of the references. Uh, a lot of Django caching documentation, you can probably see when you go to the site, you'll say, hey, I use the same examples that Django has used. Yes, I copy pasted from there. Uh, yeah, they're they are pretty good examples for select related and uh, for uh, caching decorators, right? Uh, any questions? Uh, when you are trying to cache in a template, what there was an issue that I faced. It was like there's a form which is common to everybody, mm -hmm. right? But when you cache it, the CSR of token remains same for everybody, and then you'll get. So, so you cache it for every user. Yes. So you. Uh, let me see. If you make two requests to the same page, the CSR of token has to change. So if you yep. cache it for the same user also. Hey, so what you're saying is uh, your request username. Oh, if you're talking about CSR of token, you, then you probably don't. Uh, yeah, you probably have a very small caching window, or you use uh, Ajax. So at slide we we'll use Ajax for all our forms. We scratched our head a lot on this one. Yeah. And the another thing was uh, templates. When mm -hmm. you uh, when you include a lot of templates, uh, compiled templates and all. If you'd like to say a little bit about that, mm -hmm. to use compiled templates when you are making a template by including a lot of smaller templates. Oh, I haven't used compiled templates in Django yet. I oh. need to make a note. I'll need yeah. to learn that. Thanks. <laughs> Hello. Doesn't Jinja use compiled templates? I thought Django templates are not compiled yet. Uh, they are. Okay. I'll I'll learn that. Um, Hi. Uh, mostly, I have uh, spoken about SQL queries, right? So, what if I want to use with no SQL databases? 
why not? No SQL databases are equally slow. I mean, they are slower than RAM. <laughs> No, they're, they're pretty good. So NoSQL was probably an attempt to uh, make, uh, you know, databases or I'll say NoSQL are SQL databases that are pure indexes. You're probably just doing index queries. But yes, if you have any large queries that you're doing on NoSQL, you can catch it. Variable not recognized, dude. People call me Jeet. No, so if you have a very, very volatile data, use uh, something like a Redis, which is an in-memory database with disk storage. If your data is very volatile, I mean, I have friends who do gaming APIs and gaming leaderboards and storing and all. They use Redis. It just makes sense. You don't save it in SQL. So that's hello? the architecture point. Uh, hello. In, in, in your experience, what is the best cloud uh, cloud hosting provider for Django? For? Uh, for Django, for hosting. Uh... There is no right answer, really. I've used AWS. I'm pretty happy. I really like uh, you know their uh, managed services. Uh, we use DigitalOcean right now. We are happy with that. Um, I haven't used Heroku. People are very big fans of Heroku. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. Almost all big ones are good. Thanks. Any further questions? Thank Hi. you so much. Oh, yeah.